Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the latest webinar from American Chipper Research. We apologize for the bad echo that you may have been hearing. I'm Patrick Duffy, Research Director at American Chipper, and your moderator for today's discussion. Today's webinar, Navigating New Realities, Peak Shipping Season, Intermodal Outlook, is brought to you by BNSF Railway, the Class One railroad connecting North America's largest consumer markets. We have guests logged in from around the globe, including some of the world's largest shippers, transportation providers, and other types of professionals involved with every aspect of supply chains. We're all eager to get a better understanding of this year's peak shipping season and what's driving the particularly daunting conditions this year for U.S. importers. A combination of many factors coming together at the same time has set the stage for shipper anxiety. Surging imports earlier this year, perhaps in an attempt to beat the imposition of tariffs, calculated reduction in services and capacity on major trade lanes, general rate increases in emergency bunker fuel charges, even more political risk as trade war rhetoric continues to grow, trucking capacity concerns and correspondingly high rates, growing rolled cargo pools at Asian ports and other persistent challenges facing those with less profitable cargoes have BCOs shipping earlier than normal, providing their transportation providers with forecasts up to a month out in an attempt to make sure inventories are adequate for the holiday season and wondering whether they'll have to make hard decisions in the coming weeks about whether to rely on air cargo to fill the shelves. With all these factors facing shippers, this afternoon I'm pleased to be joined by three professionals from BNSF Railway, Alliance Shippers, and Freight Waves that have their pulse on the intermodal marketplace and the factors impacting how shippers can best navigate the new realities of peak shipping season. Joining me today is Tom Williams. Tom is Group Vice President for Consumer Products at BNSF Railway. Tom is responsible for domestic and international intermodal marketing and sales, as well as the automotive business. Tom is a lifelong railroader with deep experience and understanding of this dynamic marketplace. Thank you for joining us today, Tom. Thank you. I'm pleased to also have with us Steve Golich. Steve serves as the Executive Vice President and the Chief Operating Officer of Alliance Shippers, Inc., the largest privately held intermodal marketing company in the United States. Prior to assuming, assuming this role, Steve served as Regional Vice President for 17 years with Alliance. Steve also previously served as President of Celtic International, a TransPlace company, and President at Nutrans Companies, Inc. Steve is going to share his deep operational knowledge with us about how he has managed peak shipping, season, peak shipping seasons over the years, how things have changed, and how shippers can best manage this year's shipping concerns. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon, everyone. Finally, I'm excited to be joined by Ibrahim Bayan. Ibrahim is the Chief Economist at Freight Waves. Some of our returning viewers may remember that we had Daniel Pickett, their Chief Data Scientist, with us on our last webinar talking about the future of blockchain technology across supply chains, uh, starting with the humble purchase order of all things. Ibrahim is a business economist with a wealth of experience in the transportation sector. Prior to joining Freight Waves, he headed up economic analysis at UPS beginning in 2010. At UPS, he played a key role in building up their forecasting capabilities. While at UPS, Ibrahim also was responsible for disseminating the economic outlook both inside and outside of UPS, delivering key insights on the state of the economy and how it impacted the transportation industry and shippers. Now at Freight Waves, Ibrahim covers developments and trends in the global economy. He has a particular focus on understanding the links between the macro economy and freight markets. He's going to leverage data from Freight Waves' sonar platform to set the stage for our intermodal outlook today and for our discussions on best practices for navigating the new realities of peak shipping season. Thank you all for joining me today. So. Let's quickly go over the main topics of today's conversation with the reminder to use the Q&A box to provide us with your most pressing questions. We'll kick things off with Ibrahim giving us a rundown of some of the drivers of the current state of the shipping industry, examining some, of, some domestic freight statistics, and discussing the influence of e-commerce. We'll also get into the drivers behind shippers' anxiety around capacity this season. We'll transition the discussions uh, to Tom and Steve around intermodal solutions to current market conditions, and hear how Steve 
has successfully managed peak seasons in the past and what might be different this time around. Finally, we'll discuss some best practices to help you manage your own supply chains this season and take questions from the audience. Remember to make sure to submit your questions through the Q&A panel on the left-hand side of your screen. You can submit questions at any time during the webinar. Also, if you're having any technical difficulties, please use the question and answers uh, section and the webinar technician can assist you. You can adjust your audio controls with the play icon button located in the middle of the red buttons on the bottom of your screen, and you can maximize the slides window for a better viewing experience. So with that housekeeping taken care of, once again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and express a thank you to BNSFF for bringing us together today for our first ever peak shipping season intermodal outlook. With that, Ibrahim, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and I'd just like to thank everybody for having me join this, uh, this fantastic panel of speakers. Uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on our company and myself uh, before dipping into some of the conditions that I think are going to help shape uh, the, the state of, of the intermodal market headed into the peak season this year. So my company, uh, um, I, I serve as the chief economist for a company uh, called Freightways. Now, what we try to do at Freightways is to use data analytics to provide market insights for uh, the freight industry. And so we have a number of different fronts. We, we provide an awful lot of commentary on, on freight demand and freight conditions. Uh, we also have a data platform known as Sonar, which collects um, and analyzes data uh, related to freight conditions regionally. Um, and so the, 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 with the overarching goal of just trying to bring additional transparency using data into the market. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to begin by stepping back a little bit and talking about where we are as an economy overall uh, this year as we head into the second half of the year. Um, and, and so here you have a, a couple of different uh, data points here. There's, there's uh, real, real GDP. The black line is the quarter over quarter real GDP growth. The blue line is year over year growth. Um, and then there's a, a horizontal line here that I that I drew that basically shows what trend growth, what I would consider trend growth in the in the overall macro economy. That is to say that like a normally well functioning U.S. economy should be growing around two to two two point two and a quarter percent. Uh, and as you can see, we've we've been able to exceed that over the past several quarters. That really beginning in 2017, um, we've pretty consistently experienced quarter over quarter growth that has exceeded trend. Um, and particularly this year, because of some of the policy that was enacted at the start of the year, it's helped push GDP growth even higher. The second quarter of this year grew at 4.1% uh, annualized pace, which is one of the strongest quarters since the recession. Um, now, you can look through the history, and you can see that there's been other other times where this has been the case. Like, we've had strong quarters of growth, and we've, we've had pretty strong years uh, since the recession has ended. Uh, but th there's pretty good reason to suspect that this time around it's going to feel a little bit different than it has in the past, and that the economy is in a, in a bit of a different state than what it was, say, uh, four or five years ago. Next slide, please. And what I mean by that is when you look at uh, measures of how much slack is left in the economy, it feels like the U.S. economy is sort of running out of excess capacity. So here I have a couple of, a couple of different uh, pieces of data. The blue line here is our real GDP performance uh, really since the uh, uh, over the past 20 years, right? And you can see uh, that it took a hit during the recession, and you've kind of had a gradual return to growth during this kind of expansion. The black line is, is what's called potential GDP. Now, potential GDP is essentially a measure of how much the economy would be producing if it was functioning normally. So that is to say that if there was no high unemployment, if everybody was, was kind of employed in proper positions, um, then this is the amount of, of output that the economy could produce. And, of course, you take a big hit uh, during the recession. You separate from sort of our actual output from the amount that we had the potential to produce during the recession because you had high unemployment. A lot of people that could have been working were out of work, uh, and we kind of gradually – been trying to make up ground ever since then. Now, with this last GDP release from the second quarter, the economy has essentially made up all of that lost ground, and we're growing about, uh, we're producing about as much as we have the capability to produce uh, in a normal in a normal functioning economy. And so, what this means is that the economy is out of excess capacity. Um, 
and that when you look at different measures of capacity utilization or unemployment, um, we're getting back to what you would consider normal functioning uh, conditions. And so, you know, as I mentioned on the previous slide, while we've had strong periods of growth before, it's going to feel a lot different when capacity is already, when, when we're out of all of this excess capacity and we're, you know, we're starting to experience this strong growth in an economy that's already utilizing all of its available resources. And it's going to make for a very tough slog to kind of meet demand going forward as we continue to experience growth that exceeds uh, what the underlying trend growth is in the economy overall. Next slide, please. So I wanted to take a quick look and dive in on some of the drivers of freight demand and how they've been performing over the past uh, year or so. The top left shows retail sales in the economy. The beginning of the year wasn't a great period for overall retail spending. Um, you know, after the hurricane rebuilding phase ended at the end of uh, at the end of last year, there was a surge of, of spending. Then, once we got to the other side of that, I think consumers took a bit of a break, um, and there was a period of two to three months where the amount of retail spending really didn't grow much. The second quarter was much better. Um, there was a surge of, of activity in the retail space in March, April, May, and June, uh, and then continuing into July. The retail spending has, has been proceeding pretty solidly since then. Uh, and I think as you go forward, I would expect that to continue, that when you look at the conditions that help drive retail spending in the economy, uh, consumer confidence is still pretty high. Job growth is, is, is still high in the economy, and that, that boosts incomes, and that, that helps drive a lot of the consumer spending uh, that, that goes on. Now, that helps freight demand, of course, because all of these goods that, that consumers end up buying have to get there somehow. Um, there's been you know, some reports that even brick-and-mortar stores have, have been doing well over the past couple of months. Both Walmart and Target, when they had their earnings calls, they noted how strong uh, even in-store traffic was. Uh, but the real strength within the retail space has been within e-commerce, which is seeing growth, um, you know, in excess of 15% year over year over the past several quarters. Uh, Ibra, we're, we're certainly seeing that um, impact intermodal demand in terms of strong retail sales. And do you think there's a component of um, it, retail and more broadly overall business inventories tightening a little bit that, uh, would also lead you to be optimistic for a sustained, strong freight environment? Sure. I mean, I think when you look at inventories um, overall, they're, they're not at historical lows, but they're pretty lean in the economy right now. Um, and normally, if you have this kind of combination of like lean inventories and high demand, what that really means is there's a lot of in, uh, inventory turnover, which means that inventories have to be replenished and sent out uh, over and over again, and this is particularly true for e-commerce kinds of uh, kind of movements. Um, I, I think the strength of e-commerce bodes well for freight demand. Um, you know, on the inbound side, you're going to have an awful lot of replenishments of like fulfillment center, center kind of inventories in order to meet demand. Going outward, I, you know, I, I think most of the demand gets fulfilled primarily by parcel delivery companies like a UPS or a FedEx. Um, like most of the most of the final mile shipments to the to the end consumer takes place the, through smaller packages. But I think inbound, when, as you replenish fulfillment centers and distribution centers, um, I think that certainly helps freight demand quite a bit. You know, guys, this is Steve. I, I've, I'd like to comment also that we've seen – some resurgence with some of the big box retailers, actually. I mean, some of them certainly are having their 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 difficulties. But if you look at the uh, articles that, like a Macy's, for example, has reported that th their traffic is actually up, and uh, things are improving from where they were a year or two or so ago, and certainly that uh, results in in significant more more shipping and truckload quantities. We've noticed sure, quite and a bit. And I would of that agree. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. Like it was. You know, for a long time, the big story was basically that retailers were dying in the brick-and-mortar space, right, that you had, like, all these store closings um, and people didn't want to go to stores anymore. Uh, but then, you know, over, the, over this past quarter, I think you're right. Like, a lot of the bigger retailers, um, they, they came out and they said, you know, in-store traffic looks pretty good uh, from our perspective. Um, again, I mean, Target released their, their earnings results, I guess, either yesterday or the day before, and, 
Um, it was one of the big highlights in there. It's just that like the in-store sales were pretty were pretty strong as well. E-commerce, of course, out, outpaces what goes on in the in the brick and mortar space, but still, um, pretty encouraging news that, that there does seem, it, seem to be some life in there. And, and a lot of credit due to the ingenuity of the, of the people behind that for the, all the different things that they're doing to attract store traffic with uh, uh, value ads and and you know just the things that they're doing Starbucks all over and all those kinds of things I think are getting people to to get out. So it's 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 nice to see those types of businesses have been part of the American economy forever and ever and ever. And certainly the e-commerce is an onslaught that they're not accustomed to seeing previously. And uh, many of them are sort of so to speak weathering the storm. Sure, sure. Um, and I think other spaces in the U.S. economy look pretty good as it relates to freight demand. When you look at manufacturing activity, uh, it's been proceeding at a pretty solid pace. Um, particularly when you look at like overall industrial production, the energy sector is, has uh, grown at a, a very high clip this year, uh, and that helps drive freight activity as well. Like most people kind of think of like a rise in, of energy prices as being just bad for, for freight because, it, it, I mean, typically, historically it's just meant higher fuel costs, right? I mean, you have like a rise in oil prices, that means you're going to pay more for diesel or, or, or what have you. Um, but there's an awful lot of freight activity that's tied to our energy sector right now. That when every time there's a new oil rig that opens up, um, it, 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 all of this increase in like fracking activity, it, I mean it's it's trucks, it's intermodal that that uh, and, and rail that helps bring all those materials um, to to make all that operate. So I, I actually think that like it, it becomes sort of a net positive for freight, even though you have the drag from higher fuel costs, uh, and it certainly helped boost our overall production in the U.S. economy. Um, overall. Uh, and then the third piece is, is sort of trade. I mean, when you look at the trade numbers, there's been a lot of concern lately over what trade is going to look like uh, with all the recent moves in policy. But at least so far, the, the export numbers and the import numbers have been pretty strong. I mean, you're, you're looking at over double-digit growth in exports in the U.S. economy now, close to double-digit imports, uh, growth in imports in the U.S. economy. And all of these things point to just very, very strong demand for freight uh, to the extent that it holds up uh, throughout the remainder of the year. Ibrahim, this uh, is Patrick. Uh, I might yes. have a question on that last point. Uh, a lot of stories in the financial news over the past week have been talking about how we're uh, at the historical, uh, the historical point for the longest bull market runs. In your opinion sure. and from the data that you're seeing, do you think that you know the market still has uh, room to run, or are, are we uh, – is the – the tightness between potential GDP and realized GDP, are, are we running up against some real headwinds to continue to grow? So, I mean, I would, I would say that I think it's going to be challenging uh, going ahead, but there's, there's definitely still some room to grow. Um, if you look historically, like the economy has been able to, to, to grow beyond its potential, I guess you would say, um, for periods of time. And so I, I would expect, I would expect that we're going to we're going to enter into one of those kinds of periods uh, going forward in the next couple of quarters. But what you are going to find is, you know, all of these reports of having difficulty finding skilled workers, um, rising backlogs of orders, longer um, longer delivery times, and things of that nature. Those kinds of uh, those kinds of things are going to begin to increase as as time goes on because it's just going to get harder and harder to get things done. In an, in an economy that's moving so tightly, um, you know, one of the things that you, if, if you ever uh, pay attention to like surveys of manufacturers, one of the things that they almost always bring up is how difficult it's been for them to find qualified workers and how they can't seem to meet all the available demand that's out there right now. That, that everybody kind of wants to buy, consumers want to buy, businesses want to buy the things that U.S. manufacturers are trying to produce, uh, but they've had they've, they've been starting to have some difficulty in, in filling all of those orders. And I think as you go forward, it's, it's going to be even more challenging. Now, as long as the as, as long as the, de the demand is there, I think you know you, you're able to push a little bit past capacity um, temporarily, but eventually it's going to become a challenge. So as you start to get to like the end of 2019, maybe beginning parts of 2020, it becomes a real issue for for growth. Great, great. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move forward with some of these other data points. Yep. Um, yeah. So. I mean, we kind of talked about this a bit earlier, but I just wanted to touch a little bit on inventory trends. Uh, this is the, the inventory to sales ratio in the U.S. economy, so it's a measure of 
how many inventories, how much uh, businesses are holding in inventories relative to the amount of sales that they have. Uh, and you can see it's been trending down really since the, the second half of, uh, of, uh, of 2016. Um, it's not at any kind of all-time low, like in, uh, inventory sales ratios have been lower before, but oftentimes when you find inventory to sales ratios lower than what they are now, it's because demand really isn't all that strong. Like, um, you know, if you, if you look during the period like uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, there was still an awful lot of uncertainty about where the economy was going. Um, at, at times there were, there were worries that like the economy might dip back into a recession. And so businesses weren't, uh, weren't really gearing up to have an awful lot of inventories on hand to meet all the sales. This is a little bit different because, you know, as I just got, got finished talking about, demand has been very strong uh, for several quarters now. And businesses know that, that demand is, is strong. So the idea that they're keep, keeping lean inventories means that there's going to be an awful lot of, uh, of inventory turnover. And so what this means for, from a carrier perspective is it just a, it's just more pressure to make sort of just-in-time kind of delivery shipments that people are holding only as much inventory as they have to. And when you want to operate that way, it basically means that, that you, you know, when you need the goods to be replenished, they have to be re replenished in a timely fashion because you don't have an awful lot of excess inventory um, to fill any kind of existing demand. And so, you know, this lean inventory, it's just, um, I mean, it's a positive one from a freight demand kind of standpoint. It means that there's still quite a bit of, uh, of freight demand, but it does put pressure on carriers to, to do things in a timely fashion. Steve, can you talk a little bit about how maybe your, your customers' expectations have changed over the past five years as the, uh, the rise of the always-on, always-available economy has kind of uh, spilled over from, from, uh, from different sectors? Sure. I, I, maybe the, the, the most important point is uh, to, to make is that there's an education process that needs to go on, and it is going on, and it needs to continue going on, because we've moved rather suddenly from an environment to where uh, transportation providers such as Alliance and others were aggressively looking to increase market share with, with you know, full-bore sales programs and things like that. And uh, recently, uh, attesting to all the things that Ibrahim has said, that, that, that we just don't have the capacity to meet the demand, so we're not on the front edge of looking for more business as much as we are in, in maintaining and protecting the business that we have today. So the things that, that shippers had come to expect and built into their, their receiving patterns, shipping patterns, have changed significantly. Uh, there's just an awful lot of business today compared to what we saw even a year ago and certainly two years ago, and, and largely we call this an oversold market. So, you know, we do our best to working with our underlying providers to educate our shippers and receivers on how things have changed, how transits have changed, how transit schedules have changed. And one another big element that happened recently was the uh, ELD mandate, the electric uh, electronic logging data mandate, which has been around for a while, but it wasn't really enforced until this spring. And that basically limited the hours that drivers can work and hours that drivers can drive. And some of the things that we did in the industry before are no longer physically possible or legally possible. An example as it relates to intermodal in the, uh, in the Chicago market where I live and, and, uh, and operate, uh, the Chicago Railroad ramps service really six states. And for an example, uh, taking freight from uh, off a of Chicago ramp into certain parts of Michigan to serve the uh, automotive uh, business, so we, a driver can't do it anymore. A driver cannot make a turn in the day. And so what does that mean to a shipper or receiver? Well, number one, uh, the capacity for getting that stuff has been reduced. And number two, the price has gone up because you're now paying a driver essentially for two days out of his work week than you were recently for one. So things have changed significantly. Again, I, I, I stress that education is, is the most important part of, of adapting to all of this. Great, great point. And uh, to that point, let's continue with the education from Ibrahim. Um, so, so it's, I mean, it's difficult to talk about sort of the, the conditions within freight and the supply of freight without digging into the trucking market, because I think a lot of um, what's going on with, with freight markets in general begins with just the, the difficulty that trucking companies have had 
um, in, in finding enough drivers to, to move all of the available freight. Uh, and so here I have just um, some recent trends on employment within truck transportation. Um, and you can see that, that uh, trucking has made some improvements over the past uh, year or so, like really beginning at the end of last year, we saw hiring within trucking pick up in a noticeable way. I mean, there were, there were years where trucking employment really didn't change all that much. Um, it, it was at about 1. Uh, 1.45 million for the better part of, of several years uh, before there was a noticeable uptick at the end of last year. Um, and this is a pretty good sign, you know, that uh, that we're starting to, to see more drivers uh, being brought online. Um, trucking employment is almost 2% higher now than what it was a year ago. The, the problem is I just don't think it's quite fast enough that the, you know the amount of drivers that are being added into the into the industry isn't enough to keep pace with all the all the different kinds of improvements in in freight demand. I mean, you know, if you go back to the, if we think back to the earlier slide. Um, where all those positives were on freight demand, retail sales is about 6% higher than it was last year. Industrial production is 4.5% higher than what it was last year. Exports and imports are almost double-digit growth um, higher than what they were last year. And so 2% growth in, in the amount of drivers that are out there on the road, I, I don't think it's just an, a, enough. And so it, it, you still find yourself in this environment where there's a shortage of available truck drivers. And so what ends up happening is that you know if you can't find available truck drivers, or if it becomes prohibitively expensive to to to, uh, to move your freight your freight via truck, um, it starts to spill over into other modes of freight. And I think you know intermodal carriers have been hit uh, by a lot of freight that they otherwise wouldn't have just for the simple fact that people can't find available truck drivers. So there's you know you, you get sort of the normal um, growth in intermodal demand that you would get with a, with a strong economy. But then on top of that, you have this kind of, this freight that's, that's being dumped on intermodal carriers or rail carriers um, for the simple fact that they just can't find enough truckers that, for, for these things that would typically go uh, travel by, by truck throughout the economy. And, and Ibrahim, I'm sorry, I think an important point to make here is that intermodal requires a truck on the front and a truck on the back. So Absolutely. it's not completely removed from the, the, the issues we have with truck today and uh, driver capacity. And one thing that has not changed is uh, the barriers to become a truck driver. It's, it has not been the most desirable um, vocation uh, for a lot of reasons. And, and, you know, number one, you have to have a CDL. You have to be 21 years old. Well, for, for young people today who are looking to make a career, you and if you don't go on to, for your education, you have to do something. And a lot of them don't want to wait around to 21 to start a career. Uh, insurance requirements, uh, wage has been has been really really low in this country for a long time with truck drivers. We're starting to see that rise today, uh, to your point, and uh, that will help to attract some. But we're really still far behind the eight ball with with the driver capacity. I read somewhere, I'm not sure what it is today, but I think the average age of a truck driver in the United States is in the mid fifties, like 55 or 56. Maybe you know the real answer there, but those are important things to remember. That's right. I mean, and, it's, and it's part of the problem is that there's a, there's a real difficulty uh, when you have an older workforce like that. Um, you find yourself in a situation where you have a lot of the older drivers pushing towards retirement um, and, and you have to worry about whether or not you can bring in enough new drivers to, to backfill those positions and it becomes an additional challenge. Yeah, uh, should we go to the next forward? slide? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so connected to that, you can see quite a bit of, of rate inflation within trucking. Um, and so this is the producer price index for just a long distance truckload in the economy. Um, and you can see 11% growth year over year. The producer price index basically essentially measures like the, the, the prices that producers get for the, for the things that they produce. Uh, and so this is a, a, a pretty good aggreg aggregate reflection of just uh, what, what prices in trucking are doing uh, in the economy. And they're up 11% uh, year over year. I mean, and this is very, very textbook economics that, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where demand is high and you don't have enough uh, capacity, all, of the, all that does is put up with pressure on the amount that you have to pay for, for trucking freight. Um, and I think that that's certainly been the case. And again, this is a, another one of those situations where, you, you know, if you're a shipper, you start to see these high increases in, in the rates that you have to pay for trucking. Uh, and you begin to start to try and find other ways to 
to move your freight as a way to mitigate your over, overall transportation costs, right? And so what this really means is, I mean, this is a pretty, um, a pretty good opportunity for other modes of transportation because they're, they're going to be, um, you're going to have shippers that are looking towards these other modes as, as potential ways to move freight as a way to kind of manage the amount, their, their overall profit margin. Um, and, and we're starting to see the similar kinds of patterns emerge in other modes of freight as well. So like uh, you know, trucking prices have, have, have gone up and soon after you started to see intermodal pricing uh, also increase um, for, for similar kinds of reasons. And and so it's just uh, something to keep an eye on. It's, it's something I don't think is, is going to mitigate, at least not in, in upcoming months as you head towards the peak season. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So, one of the things that I like to to watch um, as you move to the second half of the year to get a, a gauge of how peak season performance is going to look like is, is, is so what are what are trends looking like on the west coast uh, of the economy? Um, and so th this here is some some of the proprietary data that we maintain at Freightways. This is outbound tender volume. So this measures the amount of of load accepted load tenders um, that come in in various metro areas. Um, Typically, you start to see uh, sort of strength in these kind of numbers now indicates that there's a lot of volume coming in from the ports um, that then gets moved via truck throughout the economy. And it's a sign that uh, it's a signal of how the peak season is going to look. So um, in both cases, both, both in L.A., I pick L.A. and San Francisco because it's, it's, it's close to the L.A. Uh, ports uh, and the Oakland ports. Um, but in both cases, you're seeing very strong performance in, in low volumes um, coming out of the West Coast. And so, again, I, got, I just feel like everything's kind of pointing towards a very strong peak season as far as freight is concerned. Uh, and, it, you know, I, I think the, the freight industry in general faces the challenge of trying to, of trying to you know, find enough containers or find uh, enough trucks to move all that stuff throughout the economy. Um, you know, again, I, I stress that it's, it's, it really represents a really good uh, uh, opportunity for for freight carriers. Now, this is this is load tender volume. This is this would include all different kinds of of, of load tenders. This would be like, uh, I mean, it's, it's predominantly van, but it would include all different kinds of 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 loads. Uh, we can go to the to the next slide. I had a question, Ibrahim. Uh, yes. Looking at this data, can you Point to the start of an earlier than normal peak shipping season. Is that reflected in these numbers at all, or if not, what kind of uh, data point would you look at to try to figure out when peak shipping season uh, truly started this year? So I would I would say that just the general strength of it now um, is a sign that there's there's probably more activity than there than there typically would be. So normally when you think about like the months of uh, of July. I mean, it's, it's not always like one of the strongest months of the year. Like, there's usually a, a bit of a drop off in in volume when when it comes to July. Um, so the fact that it's been strong is a, is a bit of a sign that that uh, perhaps you know companies are doing things a bit a bit different this year um, and and starting things out maybe a bit earlier than they otherwise might. And Steve, Tom, do you guys have uh, opinions on on? Yeah. Figuring it's, out how it, thanks, how and when it's the real start of a peak shipping season. It's difficult for me to say definitively that we're seeing an earlier peak trend. I mean, our overall volumes are up in the mid-single digit range, but what we are definitively seeing is a modal shift year over year between what moves inland intact in a steamship container and what transloads into domestic trailers and containers. And so I think. If you're in the um, space of transloading or if you're a domestic intermodal carrier in a 53-foot trailer or container, you're really busy right now um, and, and you're feeling you know, maybe it's earlier peak or capacity's tight, um, but from an overall rail loading perspective, when you combine the international and domestic business, and what we call international is what moves in a 20 or 40-foot container and if it transloads into a 53, then we call that domestic. But if you combine the two, um, you know, we're in that mid-single digit growth where we've been this year, but not seeing like a step level trend to suggest that overall peak is starting earlier. 
And Steve, do you we've have seen uh, this is Steve. We've we've seen. Uh, well, I, I guess uh, better better phrase it would be one of the barometers we use is when the railroads announce their peak season um, surcharge, and we had that was a little bit early for us this summer versus uh, versus previous summers. Yeah, they've also um, some of them have restricted uh, capacity for for new business coming on. So uh, that's always a barometer that we stay close to and and share with our shippers. And, and certainly that would point to that tightness that I ref referenced in the 53 foot space, um, which could be some mix shift. It could be a little bit of earlier uh, peak, but difficult to pinpoint um, that it's absolutely earlier peak. Very interesting. So, should we move forward? Yes, that's fine. Okay. So, the, the last thing I wanted to, to kind of cover, um, which is the big uncertainty around everything, is, is trade policy. That there's been a, a, quite a few changes in trade policy beginning in the start of this year uh, with some, some tariffs that were put into place um, on washing machines and solar panels. And it's really continued throughout the year that, that the United States has kind of moved more and more gradually to a, a, a much more protectionist stance. Um, it, it gets a little bit tricky to, to separate sort of the, the, rhetoric, the, the rhetoric from the actual policy that gets implemented. Um, but I do think it's starting to have material effects on the way that, that companies are, are, are going about doing business. Um, particularly when you look at, at, at trade volumes, uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that many companies have have begun like importing things or exporting things ahead of time, like uh, earlier than than they otherwise might, for fear that tariffs, you know, the tariff situation might get worse. So, say for example, if uh, in China, um, there was a lot of evidence that that they imported an awful lot more soybeans earlier than they normally would uh, during the second quarter. And the reason why is because the, uh, China began uh, slapping tariffs on, on soybean imports um, uh, during the month of July, right? And so the, the idea being that, you know, if you know the tariffs are coming and you think the tariffs might get worse, it, it probably makes sense to build up inventories a bit ahead of time. And I think as you go through the third quarter, there, pro there, there may be more of that, uh, especially as, as the rhetoric kind of ramps up. Um, right now, you know, I think most of the attention is on the U.S. and its stance towards China and the amount of tariffs that we're uh, that we're thinking about implementing on Chinese goods uh, and vice versa. Um, but it can also open up to to other countries as well. For a while, you know, um, there was talk about adding additional tariffs onto the European Union. Uh, NAFTA is still very uncertain. Like the the, the state of NAFTA is, is still very uncertain going forward. Um, and I think businesses are starting to react and just saying, you know, we're just going to prepare for um, the situation where tariffs might be worse. Now, I don't think it's, it's, it's actually manifested itself in like a lower production or less hiring or anything of that nature. But I do think companies are rethinking sort of how they, how they try and navigate through all of these policy changes uh, and prepare themselves for what could be a significantly worse trade environment uh, going forward. Great. Steve, Tom, do you have something you'd like to add for that? No, I, no nothing. Uh, you know, agree with the uh, points on trade. It's a, it does create some uncertainty. And some of the the, the impacts that uh, Ibrahim noted, we saw in some of our bulk businesses, maybe even to a greater degree, um, like on the soybeans and, and the, um, the near modal uh, ship, shipping uh, trends. And Steve, have you seen uh, the basically the rhetoric uh, driving different types of decisions for shippers? Absolutely. I, I think this this whole oversold condition in the marketplace today is certainly political. I mean, everybody has a job today, right? We see unemployment at, at sub four percent levels that we haven't seen in a long, long time, and with the tax cuts and, and those things, people have just more disposable income to spend. And you see a flinch every t every time there's a tweet that comes out of Washington, and uh, you know those things uh, do cause ripples for sure. But overall, it's it's been uh, it's just been a boom of activity. Great. And so let's transition over to Tom, uh, who's going to talk with us a little bit about uh, BNSF's uh, portfolio of options to help uh, you navigate peak shipping season. 
Tom? Yeah, and just a real quick primer on BNSF's intermodal network. Uh, so we're, um, if, you, if you look at the portfolio of business that we handle, about half of the volume is, is intermodal. And within that uh, intermodal volume, about 60% moves in a domestic either 53-foot container or trailer or 28-foot uh, pup trailer. Uh, and then 40% moves in a steamship uh, container, 20 or 40 foot intact. Um, clearly agree with all of the comments that we're in a very unique freight environment, uh, but do think that intermodal is a very good solution for the you know, evolving supply chain needs, uh, particularly in the e-commerce uh, space. You know, a couple years ago, we'd hear a lot that you know, proliferation of e-commerce within the retail space might be a headwind for intermodal shipments because of the delivery requirements. But what we have seen is that as uh, fulfillment centers and distribution centers have expanded within metropolitan areas, getting that freight into um, the places, you know, the, the regions where people live, um, you know, intermodal is every bit as effective uh, in, in an e-commerce supply chain as it is in a in a, a brick and mortar supply chain. We do think that because of the complexity of the fulfillment center needs that, you know, service consistency and, uh, you know, ETA accuracy, shipment visibility is, is probably more important now than ever. Uh, we're certainly doing a lot with advanced analytics uh, algorithms to provide uh, better shipment visibility in terms of ETA timing, and, and we know that's going to continue to be more and more important over time as part of our uh, technology initiatives. One thing I want to point out on this chart is that you know, when you look at the trends, uh, both for us and the industry going back to uh, the, the peak prior to the recession and the long, slow recovery, that chart goes through 2017, but you can see on the chart that you know, really, the, the overall intermodal demand is just slightly now uh, trending up above that pre-recession peak of 2006. I commented on the mixed shift year over year this year between international and domestic, and that's been an ongoing trend. Uh, certainly in 2006, the majority of our intermodal business moved in a 20 or 40 foot steamship container. I think that was true for the industry. And that, that mixed shift, which has moved freight and transloading into 53-foot containers um, has been evolving over the course of the long uh, recovery. But with that, we've spent a lot of money on our infrastructure, uh, even as freight levels were down. So we spent $60 billion since 2001. Uh, we've got a quadruple track project that will cut into service early in September in Amarillo. So we've looked at points where we've double tracked between Los Angeles and Chicago and triple tracked in the area outside of San Bernardino, Cajon Pass, we call it, several other locations. We continue to expand our network to handle additional freight flows across the rail line. And then likewise, we've added uh, incremental hub capacity. We had a big project at San Bernardino, California last year, a big project at LA this year uh, to continue to add hub capacity over time. Um, and then recognizing that mix shift, there was a question on things that we're doing to add capacity in this environment. We've got four intermodal facilities in Chicago, uh, one of which has always been exclusively uh, focused on 20 and 40 foot shipping containers. And uh, after Labor Day weekend, we'll open up our, our Logistics Park Chicago facility in Joliet to domestic shipments uh, coming out of Los Angeles, uh, recognizing just there's an increasing demand and, and adding that lift capacity for the domestic intermodal shipments as well. So I think with, within the, the, the rail space, um, there's, there's, there should be and there is capacity to continue to grow, um, and especially when you consider where the industry was uh, just leading into the recession. Uh, the mix shifts uh, definitely drive some feelings of tightness um, in the mode within which intermodal moves, domestic versus international, and then also certain hub facilities which are primarily one mode versus another. We can see some isolated places where you know, we're a lot busier year over year than maybe that mid-single-digit growth rate um, would uh, would portend. But, you know, I think that, as Steve noted earlier, there's there's a truck move on either end of each intermodal shipment. And, you know, the unique thing about uh, what's happening this year, uh, especially with um, the onset of ELDs holding everybody accountable to those rules that have been out there, 
we're seeing tightness in certain dray markets uh, affecting the intermodal door-to-door -door move uh, for sure. So next slide. And then just um, you know, thinking about you know that network, and you can see generally where our key routes are between uh, the West Coast uh, U.S. intermodal inland facilities and ports to uh, population centers in te Texas, Midwest, Chicago, and the gateway uh, interface we have with both of our eastern partners into the east. And then we've worked over the last year and a half to establish a very quickly growing service uh, with Kansas City Southern into um, into Mexico as well, so connecting those uh, production and consumption markets uh, across the U.S. and uh, and Mexico. And yeah, the other, totally. I've I've heard that a lot of shipments are moving to Mexico to avoid some of the U.S. ports. Uh, have you have you seen that, or are you hearing that? No, and 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 th thanks for that comment. Um, you know, I, I again going back to those shipment trends going all the way back to 2006, I think the U.S. West Coast ports, um, L.A. Long Beach, Oakland, Tacoma, Seattle, um, all are well positioned to handle more freight than what's coming through. And year, even year over year, um, I, you know, I would say in the Southern California port complex, we're seeing um, there's, there's been a lot of initiatives within the ports to improve fluidity and productivity. And I think the port complexes uh, from an interface with rail are operating quite well. Any, you know, the uh, the other point that I would make there is when, you know, there's there's been uh, industry consolidation and shifting alliances within the steamship space, and any time uh, one of those mergers or alliance shifts takes place, again, there's a mix shift in terms of which terminals are utilized and vessel strings and so forth uh, that can be a little bit disruptive. And then as things normalize, and and we're in that normal normalization phase right now, I think after the last major uh, steamship line merger, but you know, I would say that the port complexes on the West Coast are operating quite well. Great. Should we should we move forward? Yep. Okay. Uh, so we're going to transition over to Steve, who is basically going to give us a rundown of uh, how he's been running peak shipping season with Alliance. So thank you. So what you see there is the uh, the Alliance commercial. That, that's a picture of one of our trailer units and in the background is to be in Santa Fe and the significance of that is that we have an exclusive arrangement with BN uh, in the western states so they are our only underlying provider uh, that fleet consists of about 2200 trailers we are a 100% trailer fleet uh, not container and you can go next Patrick that's a bit of an kind of an overlay of the uh, BN Santa Fe service, those are the ramps that we use. And for purposes, uh, today's purposes, I'm going to speak uh, mostly about the, um, the, the private fleet that we have, which is uh, a largely produce business, which comes out of the, the Pacific Northwest, California, and some of the Western states. The uh, ramps that have stars there are, are ramps that we go in and out of, and Chicago being basically the, or not basically, Chicago is the gateway to get us to the markets in the east. It's important uh, when you look at that map to see up in the northeast that New York market, New York and New Jersey Philly market is the largest consumer market, and it's, it's important for us to get there. You can go to the next slide, Patrick. Okay, so in normal times, produce is about 23% of our, our total freight. We handle anything that can go in a reefer, a refrigerator. A, my nomenclature is reefer. <laughs> um, and uh, during peak, uh, peak season for produce, it jumps up to about 35%. We're in peak right now for certain, certain commodities, and that kind of changes uh, along um, up and down the coast. Uh, right now, we're we're basically finishing up peak season in California. We've moving down a little bit in towards uh, the, the Yuma is a big region for us, where we handle quite a bit of lettuce. And then PNW is a is a market that we're in. Really, September through May, apples is a big commodity for us there. Uh, 
Time is critical when you're handling produce. Shelf life is very, very important. Talk about one product in particular, lettuce. Lettuce has a 16-day shelf life, which means that the moment I pick it up from a farm in Salinas, California, and get it to the markets in New York, I have 16 days to get it to your table for you to eat. Any delays basically say, you know, we can't do this. It's got to be serviced by truck. Because of the speed of the BN Santa Fe's uh, trains on uh, expedited, this allows us to get freight typically into the New York market in about six and a half days, leaving nine to ten days left for distribution and get it into the stores for, for consumers to purchase. And Steve, you can do you go next, provide, Patrick. Uh, sensor technology yourselves, or is that something that's provided by shippers? How, how do you guys get uh, supply chain visibility into the state of produce? Yeah, if you if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, we talk about technology there a little bit. We, our entire fleet is equipped with two-way telematics, right? And it's basically cellular technology. With that, we track 100% of the time that your shipment is picked up to deliver. We have complete visibility of the location of the unit, the temperature of the unit, the performance of the unit, the fuel burn of the unit. It's pretty sophisticated stuff that uh, is also equipped with alarms. So we do have 24-hour monitoring, but we have an alarms that would could trigger um, a dispatcher or a customer service person to uh, change a function, and that would be an alarm that said that maybe the, the temperature is supposed to be 38 degrees and we're reading a 40-degree a, a kind of thing. And so that would require some um, some customer service operation at that point. Uh, the technology also manages the, the minute that we pick it up, the minute that the door closes, and the minute that the door opens at the other end, and when the unit is empty. The uh, technology also allows us to pre-cool our units to the temperature that shippers require. It's not where you just back the unit up to a, a dock and have someone there set the temperature. It comes in at the temperature that it was required. The key with uh, collaborating with the or partnering with the BNSF is a better word is because of their expedited service we look like a truck and so when you're talking about how do you get additional capacity uh, you know look like a truck smell like a truck feel like a truck LA for example or Southern California to Chicago we regularly record transit times that meet or beat a single driver and so that allows certain commodities of produce to go on intermodal where it otherwise would not if we were uh, under standard transit times. Mm -hmm. This is a business that we got into many, many years ago with the assistance of the BN Santa Fe. They encouraged us to get in. We started this with 200 reefers way back in the, gosh, I don't know, late 80s, I think it was. And since then, we've grown to where this is about one third of my total business by volume. Wow. Yeah, uh, I, you I, mean, can I go think to the that next speaks to the, the, um, the shipment visibility uh, importance uh, in, in the overall supply chain, and certainly applaud your efforts. And you see a lot of technology also in, in the uh, terminal space. Um, what OOCL has done down at the Long Beach Container Terminal in terms of that automation project, you can imagine how that technology uh, is also a potential to be deployed at inland facilities. We're certainly looking at some tests in, in terms of uh, how we can leverage automation, but I think technology will definitely help the intermodal product continue to evolve and strengthen over time. Uh, another point that I should make here is BN support of uh, of trailers is very important to us. As I mentioned, we are 100% trailer fleet. Trailer simply means we are not waiting in line for chassis. We are not managing chassis. Our unit arrives with wheels already intact, and so that uh, creates a little bit more speed for us. And all these things are necessary to make us a, a viable market, uh, viable um uh, op option for produce shippers. You can go to the next slide, Patrick. And so, uh, you know, maybe maybe sustainability has lost a little a little bit of its uh, of its charm, I guess, with all the things that are going on. But I thought it was important to to just just give this slide. It's it's 
self-explanatory for the most part, but, but intermodal in general reduces the carbon emissions that we have in this world. And uh, just a, a note about the refrigerated units that are attached to our trailers, uh, that's, doing, that's having the same effect. Every gallon of fuel that one of our reefer units burns is about 22 pounds of, of CO2. Uh, so by moving it without a truck pulling it, we're reducing emissions and also moving it quicker than we would on a standard service is shortening the amount of time that that reefer unit is burning, which is also contributing to the reduction in the CO2. Just an important yeah. fact. We, we were actually, uh, I guess, backing up to technology a little bit, we also have 500 of our units, so about a quarter of our fleet, equipped with solar panels. So we're recharging our units en route just from, you know, basically using the sun, and uh, that's a pretty neat thing. We're pretty proud of that. And are these ESG or environmental initiatives, are these something that are being driven by the customer demands? I mean, uh, new reporting standards for th that their customers are requiring? It sure is. That's a big part of it. When you do business with uh, shippers today, uh, they all talk about it. They all have an environment conscience and, and – uh, it's important, and uh, you know there are, there are programs such as SmartWay that we are a, a, a perennial winner of awards from SmartWay that, that you know actually act as a guide for us to follow and, and um, you know report to uh, the community that this is of big interest to us. It's, we all have a responsibility to this country, and, and you know we're, we're proud to do it. Yeah, that's a best practice, and with that, let's move to the best practices for the audience. Absolutely. Uh, just like I think one last comment would be on reliability uh, with the when you with the expedited service you can you can bank on it. You know the, the trains run on time, uh, deliveries are on time, and that certainly helps with uh, meeting customers' expectations and helping us with velocity. Let's face it, one of the best ways to create capacity is by improving velocity. And so when you can count on a unit being unloaded for you or Draymond to pick it up and not have to wait, and uh, you're actually creating velocity. And that's how you grow the size of a fleet without actually investing in it is, is through velocity. So we've found great, great reliability with the BN Santa Fe on their expedited network. Um, you know, trains don't stop in Las Vegas to make a bet, right? I mean, you put them on a ramp, and the next time you see them is from another ramp. So it's been uh, really the most important reason why we've been so successful in this business uh, vertical. And Tom, do you want to chime in? I don't know if I have anything to, to add to that, but um, those were kind, kind comments about the expedited service and and. And certainly just for the broader group to recognize, you know, we do offer two different service levels uh, for domestic intermodal shipments, a standard service and an expedited service. And, and we have seen um, the most growth within that expedited service offering this year, whether it's the temp temperature controlled uh, space that Steve moves in, but also um, our LTL and parcel business uh, has grown uh, quite strongly within that domestic uh, portion of our business this year, uh, leveraging that expedited service. Great. great. And so we're, we're quickly coming up on uh, the end of our budgeted time for this afternoon's webinar. Uh, there was one interesting question that came in. Um, to, Tom, can, can we ask a question real quick? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the audience member asked, the window of opportunity is wide open for intermodal to gain share from the highway but little progress has been made. What plans does BNSF have to create incremental capacity and overcome the headwinds created by the Eastern Railroad? Yep, and I, tr I tried to touch on that and just in terms of the investments that we're making uh, and also leveraging, you know, because of the mix shift toward domestic uh, new intermodal hub capacity within our network uh, and, and making that available for domestic uh, shipments as well. But I will make one more comment as it relates to capacity. And that is, I think, retailers, as they think about using, or any company um, in their supply chain using intermodal, uh, historically, um, you know, the, the intermodal supply chain is a seven-day-a-week, 24-by-7 operation. 
and a lot of the the companies that use intermodal in their supply chain operate five days a week. And so there's a considerable amount of available capacity um, over the weekend and into the first part of the week that's underutilized today. And then um, there's a big push at the end of the week. So we see about 50% of our intermodal shipments that, that are tendered to our gates uh, come to us between noon on Wednesday and the end of the day on Friday. So we do want to work with our um, carrier partners and, and the shipping community to think about how we can smooth the freight flows over the seven-day calendar and, uh, and better leverage the capacity that Intermodal has. That's a really great point. Steve, do you have anything you'd like to add to that or uh, experience kind of dealing with those challenges? Well, I guess maybe as a closing comment for, for, for um, all of the uh, topics we talked about, shipper of choice is a term that used to be uh, I guess kind of fashionable or as a buzzword a few years ago. Well, it's really come into being today. It's, it is really, really important to help, um, you know, fill the needs of all the shippers in light of the short capacity. There are lots of things that, that shippers can do. And number one, I, I would just say, you know, let's be cognizant that, that drivers are a precious commodity today. And again, with intermodal, there's a driver on both ends of that thing. And whatever a shipper can do to make, Life easier for a truck driver, that's certainly going to go a long way with us. It's a really great point. Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time for this afternoon. Uh, however, the conversation will certainly continue both in the boardrooms across the globe and in the pages of American Shipper Magazine. I'd like to encourage everybody to consider these best practices today and how they might be included in the remainder of this year's operations and definitely when planning for next year's peak shipping season. Finally, I want to thank Tom, Steve, and Ibrahim for their insights today, and thank BNSF Railway for bringing us together to talk about the challenges and opportunities of navigating the new realities of peak shipping season. Until next time, keep up to date with all your global supply chain news and analysis through American Shipper. This is Patrick Duffy, signing off.